Beatle John Lennon once said that life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Just ask ordinary Australian Tristan Miller. Like most of us, he's experienced his share of personal and professional setbacks. Unlike most of us, those setbacks led him onto a remarkable path of challenge and self-discovery. While the rest of us were busy planning life, Tristan decided to get out and live it, setting himself the seemingly unrealistic goal of running 52 marathons in the 52 weeks of 2010. Look at that bad boy from Asia into Europe. Antarctica, we're right above now. Oh my God, look where I am. And here I am in Cuba. His odyssey would take him across all seven continents and in the process, inspire thousands of would-be adventurers worldwide. Hey, Mom. We're in Finland. <laughs> Tristan's story, an Aussies Abroad special, starts now. I probably have always set goals outside my, you know, even understanding of their possibilities, you know, like a, 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 whether I'd be capable or not, I'd just sort of go, oh, well, let's always shoot big and just see what happens. Many years ago, I, uh, I went through a divorce. Uh, that divorce was um, kind of, I guess, a defining time in my life, in some ways for the, for the worst, in, in uh, some ways for the better, because uh, what it did, it made me, first of all, it made me drink for about uh, three or four months. Got too drunk too many times and my mate pulled me up and said, you know what, you know, you're becoming a bit of a cliche. You don't want to be that guy, do you? And I really didn't want to be that guy. So what I did was I started running with this fella. His name's Rob and Rob took me for a run a few times and I started feeling better straight away. And the more I ran, the more I felt better. I decided to run a marathon. I really thought it was one of those things that, that I just wasn't capable of doing. I've never been a great runner, but I could definitely run a bit. And I always loved that sort of thrill of, you know, running across the finish line. Finished. Fin. As the Italian movie We laid out a plan. I did all the training. I finished the marathon. And when I finished it, that moment, that just changed my life. That just said, you know, you can do anything. So, do anything. What are all the other things that I've been thinking I couldn't do, that I should try to do? I've run like a marathon a year for about six years, did a couple of halves and all that kind of stuff. And luckily a few of my friends got involved as well, so running with other people always makes it a lot easier. It was just a nice little add-on to the rest of my life. You start getting fit, all of a sudden you're motivated again. Uh, running along with the Dazzler. Yeah. For this run. How you feeling, buddy? Oh, it's great. Yeah. I was working for Google, the phenomenal Google, the outrageous Google. It's a huge company and uh, it was an amazing place to work. They expanded very quickly over a 10 year period around the world and they opened little offices in places like Melbourne. Unfortunately, global economic crisis, you know, best laid plans for everyone. It didn't quite turn out the way I hoped it would, having this amazing job, and they shut my office. So I was at a little bit of a loose end. What do you think so far, mate? Pretty good? <laughs> I was training for an ultra marathon at the time. Oh, my son. Uh, the famous Comrades Marathon over in South Africa. So I headed over there to, uh, to fi finish that goal. It's a really difficult race. But it turned out to be probably the most, one of the most positive, interesting experiences in my life. After that, we went travelling around in uh, Zambia and Botswana and saw lions and elephants and little baby elephants bathing and all this really amazing stuff. And then I thought about all the other places that I haven't visited in the world and how nice it would be just to take a year off and go travelling and see more of the world. And I thought about the whole running and the whole travelling thing and how it's a great dynamic. I'd seen a calendar in Distance Running magazine and there's races in all sorts of countries every single week and you're just looking at it going, wow, if you really wanted to, you could go to all these different countries and take a camera and do a video and talk about these races and all that kind of stuff and gee, wouldn't that be nice? And then I lost my job and I thought, well, you know what? You know, that could be a rea reality if that's what I wanted. The idea was just bubbling away in his head and he, the Google office had closed down. He said, I don't know whether to move on into the corporate world at this point or not, or whether to do what I want to do and follow a dream. And I said, sweetheart, right now, really, before you settle down and have a family, is the time to do the dream. And so I started putting a plan together. And that plan evolved over about six months. But by the end of the year, it was pretty exciting. At what point was it real? 
It was very real in about end of July, start of August, when I had a job offer, which was similar kind of money to what I was making at Google, and I said no to it. Saying no to cash when you don't have a job is a really, it was something I've never ever done before. I always took the money and I just thought, you know, this time, if I'm, if I'm gonna do this with my life, I'm gonna take this year off and go for a big challenge, there's no better time than being at a loose end, having a little bit of money in the bank. The only thing that was holding me back was a mortgage and responsibilities around owning things. So uh, I sold it all. Paid for $387,000, sold, got you well. <laughs> sold the house, sold the car, sold a motorbike, sold everything else, gave all the rest of my stuff away. Well, I didn't have to be there for anything anymore, did I? Was that a liberating or a scary experience or a little bit of both? Definitely a little bit of both. Probably more scary than liberating just because we spend most of our life believing that we have to have all these things to set some kind of status for ourselves. All of a sudden, every time I got rid of something, I realised how little I needed it. So, yeah, by the end of it, it was pretty liberating. Bye. But then I was coming up against the biggest challenge of my life and there was a lot of risk involved in what I was doing and I was literally taking every coin that I had, every money, every piece of money that I had and throwing it all at a big risky adventure. That's super scary. I wouldn't even call it liberating, it's just super scary. But you know what? I promised myself that I'd go on a great adventure. I think I deserved a great adventure in my life. I think everyone deserves a great adventure in their life. So I thought, what the hell? It's my time. So how big was your pot? I had about a hundred grand altogether. I had some money stashed away in shares and all that kind of stuff. I knew that if I just went by myself and lived on milk and rice or something, it'd be 60 grand if I had to. But that would not allow me to do any of the fun stuff that's involved in travelling and I'd have to be really restrictive on the type of places I go to. And so I thought, no, you know what, like blow the whole hundred. And I actually knocked back a couple of sponsorship opportunities because I guess they wanted a bit more control than I wanted them to have over my adventure. And I didn't want to be beholden to anyone else's ideas on how this thing should turn out. A few people were saying, take the money. A few other people were saying, no, no, do what you had in your heart in your first place. And so I thought I'd stick to what's in my heart. Next on Aussies Abroad, Tristan Miller, the dream becomes a reality as Tristan sets out on his gruelling 12-month adventure. Up until January the 1st, I'd run six marathons in my life, one of them an ultra marathon, and um, that was the only international one I'd done. In the month of January, I ran seven marathons. So anything could have happened now, I could have broken myself numerous times. And I felt like I had a couple of times. The physical toll of running 42 kilometres, particularly in high temperatures and humidity, is amongst the highest in the entire sporting world. Elite marathon runners undertake months of preparation to ensure their bodies are finely tuned, then spend weeks and months recovering before commencing preparations for their next one. Tristan Miller, an average social runner, has set himself the lofty goal of running 52 marathons in just 52 weeks. His running mates at Melbourne Triathlon Club Tribal are amazed by the magnitude of the challenge. Well, being, being a marathon runner, I thought, well, you could probably do one of those, and then the next 51 are going to be a real challenge. A lot of doubters early in the day, even before he even left Australian shores. You can't possibly do that, no one's done it before, let alone travelling between countries with flights and all that. I thought he was crazy. I thought he was absolutely crazy, like most people. Wondered whether he'd actually finish it. Hoped he would, but yeah, I'm not sure there was too many people, including Tristan, that knew he would actually get to that finish line. I talked myself in and out of it quite a few times, but definitely my, uh, my mum was just scared. What was she scared of? Oh, she's just, you know, she's a mum. She's worried that I'll get hurt or that my body would fall apart and I'd be in a wheelchair. A lot of my mates were like, gee, that's really exciting, but really scary. But, you know, the ones that know me and know that I have always had some sort of craving for adventure and travel and that sort of stuff, just go, yeah, man, this is it. You, you're probably the only one of us that can afford to do this because you don't have the responsibility of children or any of that sort of stuff. Quite a few just didn't get it. Um, not because they didn't want to, just because it's just so far removed from what I've been doing for most of my life, which is building up wealth. So throwing all this away and going off to just bum around the world, I suppose, was kind of a bit weird for them. It was strange to see my dad's reaction. I was really impressed that he said, you know what, 
it's really crazy and I'm really worried about you, but it might just turn out pretty amazing for you, so go for it, go for it, mate. And I was actually pretty chuffed when he said that because I did get excited and, uh, and there was a point somewhere around the time that I said no to the job, probably on the plane really, heading back from South Africa, that I decided I really, really wanted to do it. And as I said, I talked myself in and out of it until after I said no to that job. When I said no to that job, that was the time that I knew I was gonna go. December 31, 2009. Aussie Tristan Miller is in Zurich, Switzerland for marathon one of his 52 in 52 weeks. You wouldn't believe it, but I was running late for it. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was uh, getting towards midnight. 20 minutes away from getting there and 20 minutes away from the start. So they, we're cutting a little bit fine. And the, the race itself wasn't in the middle of Zurich. It was like out, well out of town actually. Um, and so I was on a train on the way out there. I had my sister Alexis with me and I had my mate Daz with me. We got out there and we were a little bit stressed and but I got there with about 10 minutes to go. I put my gear on, I looked around, you know, everyone was really excited. But everyone was all covered up, you know, and everyone had woodies on and glasses and I looked around and thought, this is pretty surreal. I've never run a race in the dark before. The countdown was on to midnight and uh, everyone was really excited. It was 10, 9, and I'm still like grabbing my stuff and getting to the line. You know, 5, 4, 3, 2, and I'm like, oh. my sister's over there. I'm like, DLX, off we go. And just started running and uh, ran out into the night and fireworks were popping off in the distance all over the place. and. It was really cold, but really exciting at the same time. Everyone was breathing hard and there was, you know, sort of steam coming out of people's mouths and everything else. It was pretty magical. How long did it take you to get into a rhythm of what your weeks were gonna be like? Well, those first few weeks were pretty full on. I actually think I was pretty stressed out. I didn't know how I was going to go. I mean, up until that time, up until January the 1st, I'd run six marathons in my life, one of them an ultra marathon. Um, that was the only international one I'd done. In the month of January, I ran seven marathons. So anything could have happened there. I could have broken myself numerous times. And, um, and I felt like I had a couple of times. The next one was in Israel and it was actually really hot. So I got really uncomfortable. I need a walking break right now. I've hit the wall at 36 k. It really hurts. I did another one in Mumbai, which I only just managed to keep under four hours. I'm pretty much ready to die. Number three, no. Number three, yes. After I did that, I got kind of annoyed that I was getting slower, and I just decided, no, look, I, I don't have to have myself wrapped in cotton, cotton wool. I'm going to have a long year ahead of me, and I just started picking things up a bit. By the time I got to Dubai, I started racing a bit faster. Oh, I'm finishing. A couple of days later, I raced in uh, Las Palmas over in uh, the Canary Islands and I did a PB. A week later, another PB. Interesting that way your body just took a little while to adapt and then eventually the mind just told the body, well, this is what we're doing, and the body went, okay, this is what we're doing then, and then you just get into a bit of a rhythm. Tell us about what you do during the week between races. I definitely have a day off after the race. I don't do too much on a Monday. I'll, I'll get around and have a look at some of the sites, but I, you know, stay off my legs a little bit. Um, I try to travel by Tuesday. Another day, another airport. <laughs> get the flight out of the way. By Wednesday, I want to be on the track and running in this new place. Usually pretty jet lagged though, and it's hard to get going, but I've given my legs a couple of days to relax, so it should be okay. I usually just feel out that first run, just do sort of 10Ks and don't go too quick, and my legs usually feed a few signals as to what kind of injuries I'm dealing with. The monotony of travel, airports, rental cars, buses, hostels, yeah. waiting for airport security checks, yeah. how do you deal with that mentally? I, I, I th you know, for me it's the most stressful part of my year. I'm not a guy that likes wasting time and unfortunately getting on and off planes is a massive time waster and uh, I did some sums the other day and I think I've spent a solid 400 hours, like in, in you know, airports in transit. and stuff like that, in yeah. transit. So uh, it's a huge, it's a massive amount huge of time. Amount of time. <laughs> I can't fall asleep in an airport because I'll miss my plane, and that's come close a few times. So, <laughs> right. you know, like I get a bit stressed about that sort of stuff. It's a good point you raise about time zones. Uh, How much have they missed with you? Yeah, it's been the worst thing. I've been jet lagged for quite some time now. I find it really difficult to sleep more than a few hours. Um, because I just keep, I've switched so many times. Yeah. I actually sleep only for maybe two or three hours at a time in general. You know, it's just become the, the norm for me. 
and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone because it's not good, relaxing recovery sleep. Couldn't tell you where I am. <laughs> I just woke up on the train. And so I get to the end of the week and I, I, I can't sleep before a race because I'm, I'm kind of still a little bit anxious. And so I only get maybe four or five hours before a race and I can only sleep four or five hours the night after a race because my legs hurt so much. Right. And I just can't get comfortable. And then the next night I'll probably get up early and get a plane. So then I'm always in that cycle, you know? I know this seems like this is your reality right now. It probably seems kind of normal to you to be doing this, but yeah. in a couple of years' time, you'll probably look back at this and think, how on earth did I manage to do this? Yeah, I certainly won't be uh, saying, oh yeah, I'd go and do it all again, you know? Like, I'm not, I think this is a one-off thing that I managed to pull off. I don't know how I've got away with it without having to skip a race or anything like that. Um, you know, knock on wood, I've still got a few to go, but you know, it's really getting done. A guy asked me when I did a talk at Google today, hasn't all this like staying in hostels and you know, like having to sleep on park benches, hasn't that just made you harder and stronger? So when you do go out there and smash a marathon, you know, you can, you feel like you could do anything. And I'm like, yeah, I probably wouldn't mind trying to do it the other way and staying in some hotels and relaxing and that sort of stuff. Maybe I would get better if I got a bit more sleep. I had some problems with my calf, the calves in the early days, and I got really, really worried about that. But um, well, they're all strapped up these days and all held together by tape, so you know it's not so bad now. But then I'll try to do a fast run before the end of the week, and then you know just feel that like I can run fast again. And then I get to the weekend and have another crack, and see what happens. And you roll on. Yeah, yeah. I usually have a party after the race, so you know I try to celebrate my wins, sort of get out for a few beers with the locals. I'm a tourist, you know, and I really do try to get out and see the pyramids and see the gorillas and take side trips and go to Gallipoli and you know I went to a music festival, Roskilde Music Festival in Denmark, it's huge, it's amazing. In Argentina I went to Aguazu Falls, I got to Easter Island, you know I've seen astonishing stuff around the world. So I try to be a tourist because I may never get back to those places. Next on Aussies Abroad, Tristan Miller, the enormity of the task sets in. Tristan suffering both physically and emotionally. <sighs> I was really lonely, I was really sick, I couldn't be far away from the toilet and I couldn't get my stomach to settle and for two weeks I was just losing weight basically and uh, remained really sick. I'm getting angry, ah, I'm a machine, I'm a machine, I'm a steam train, I'm, oh, oh, I'm just going to get there. So I guess one of the upsides, mate, is that you get to see lots of the world and come to a lot of very interesting places. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's kind of the reason I went in the first place. <laughs> Everything else is an excuse. <laughs> yeah, right. All the running in the, initially was kind of a vehicle to do an adventure, to try a little harder, to have a big challenge in my life rather than just go traveling. He yeah. helicoptered over here from Jamaica. this way. It is running on the Great Wall of China. <laughs> Pretty hectic schedule. Yeah. Where, where of the places that you've been, have you sort of bookmarked yourself and said, I really want to get back there? Well, there's some phenomenal places I've been to. And I mean, I've already been to Cape Town twice, but I now want to go and live there for like six months. Everybody says that. It's like Sydney. It's just such a beautiful great place. City. Yeah. Such a great city. It's so much fun. Dina, <laughs> yeah, that's thank you for coming out here to support me today. <laughs> you are absolutely welcome. Yeah. And I'm so proud of what you're doing. Yeah. I think it's amazing. And welcome to Cape Town. Thank you. Thank you for your support. <laughs> and Tel Aviv. It was yeah. a surprise package. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely so much fun. The people are really relaxed and really interesting and engaging. And I mean, we're in New York City right now. I'd, I'd live here. <laughs> Do you find yourself looking ahead? Or is it, can you only look ahead to the very next one that you're running? Oh, look, I mean, you can't help getting excited about some of the big races. So New York's always been that one in the distance that I was looking forward to. I stopped in here when I did the Boston Marathon. So I was here for um, mm -hmm. just two nights and sort of a day. And you know, it was like, wow one day I'll be back here, you know? Um, but the idea of thinking too much about that when I had so much to get through and so many other places to appreciate first, yeah, you know? I mean, I'm going to Cuba in a couple of weeks. Like, I, I don't want to think about what happens in Antarctica or Costa Rica when I get to go and enjoy Cuba first, you know? There it is. It's the New York City skyline. We're gonna be running 
all the way around. <laughs> New York City Marathon, Marathon number 45. It was far none, greatest marathon of my life. It was just so exciting to be out there, like from start to finish. The crowd at the start, just the people wanting to start running. So I was just so pumped and so excited to be there. Once you started hitting the streets, the crowd support in certain sections, they were just screaming everyone's names, the guys that I was with. And I was just like shaking with excitement, you know, laughing my head off. All down through the streets, I saw my mum just before I came into Central Park. And just to see my mum and my sister there, and you know, I was ready to tear up right there, you know, just to come all this way. It's a beautiful day, and for them to be around us, oh, man, it was just so magic, right? 45 down, seven to go. Not long now, right? <laughs> Surely nothing can go wrong. You got some wood, I need to knock on wood, man. It's killing me. But every week is just such an epic adventure, and every week just has its own, you know, own gift for me. And this has been, this has been everything I hoped for, you know? And it just gets better, and so many people, I had, French guys and American guys coming up to me going, man, I've been watching you all year, you know, it's such an honor to see you. I had some other friends out there, my friend Andrew Ola out there, he found me twice, three times, just running with me with an Australian flag, you know, and man, it was just too exciting. It makes me feel like someone, you know, that's like more than I am, you know, and I'm just sitting there going, this guy's so elated to hang out with me for a minute, and I'm like, man, I'm just hanging, I'm happy to see you, you know. It's more than I could have hoped for, right? It's, I mean, it's the greatest year of my life, and now, the greatest day of my life, you know? Just unbelievable, unbelievable. What's the closest you've come to stopping? I don't feel like I've ever been in the vicinity of stopping as such. Um, not in a race, anyway. I've been sick a few times and uh, in the race that I did in Cape Town, but I'd been for a swim in Newlands Pool the day before. It was clearly just not enough chlorine. So the next morning when I got up for the race, I was really, really sick and uh, using the toilet quite a lot throughout that race and ended up throwing up a few times. I finished pretty well, but yeah, I was pretty, uh, I was pretty spent and pretty dizzy by the end of that race. I'd say that that's the worst that I've been in a race, but there's been a couple of times where mentally I've been shattered. I came second in a 100k race in Mongolia. I was really proud of that, but I didn't recognise how much it had taken out of me. And uh, when I got sick eating some food there, I was really lonely. Uh, I was really sick. I couldn't be far away from a toilet and I couldn't get my stomach to settle. And for two weeks, I was just losing weight, basically, and uh, remained really sick. He's very much a people person. So when he was surrounded by people, he was on top of the world. Um, the hardest times, I think, were in some of the more remote non-English speaking countries like Mongolia and places like that where he didn't have people around him and didn't have people that he could actually engage with um, that well and, and those were the times that I think he struggled the most. Started getting quite depressed, couldn't speak to anyone around me because no one spoke English. It was a bit frustrating but, um, but yeah it was still an astonishing experience like in retrospect it's probably the most emotional but the most interesting part of the trip. These are my legs. These guys right here, they've worked so hard today, so hard this year. But they're machines legs, they're robot legs. I talk to them, I tell them what to do, and they just keep going. I'm gonna get up to 60 k's real soon, and then it's downhill for a while. And I need some downhill, because all this uphill's killing me, but Daft Punk's saving my life here. I'm really pumped, I'm moving. I'm getting angry. Ah, I'm a machine. I'm a machine. I'm a steam train. I'm, oh, oh, I'm just going to get there. Mack truck style. Through a wall. Going all the way. Going big for summer. 100 k is getting done today. Only a marathon left. Only a marathon left. And today's antics are done. Come on. kept you going, what drove you to keep going? I got, a, I got quite a few phone calls through that period, here and there, when the opportunity was there. 
uh, from friends and family that could see that whenever I did get a chance to put a note on Facebook that I'd, I'd seemed a bit down. And, um, and they just said, just make it, just, you know, make it to Helsinki where you've got some friends. Make it across to, you know, to, to Sweden where you, where you know some people and to Denmark where you know some people. I went, by the time I got back through to, uh, to Sweden and to Denmark and I caught up with some mates, it was a bit easier. But yeah, I, I, I was on a knife edge there for a while. I definitely wanted to pack up and go home there a couple of times. <sighs> How are your feet? Both my big toes got pretty badly infected uh, after Berlin and uh, so I had to get on um, you know, antibiotics. Almost lost the, the toenails a few times but I keep, you know, I've got syringes so I keep putting holes in them to release all the pressure and that sort of stuff so yeah, you know, they're still going. I've been lucky I've never had any sort of broken bones or, or real stress in my feet. I don't know if I've just been put together in the right way in the first place or just trained my muscles to keep going but so far so good. Ahead on Aussies Abroad, Tristan Miller, the most memorable moments of a remarkable year. To look at that kind of poverty from the people that are in this township, I was running along and I just kind of looked left and I looked right and I looked left and then it all just kind of registered and I just came to a halt. Running with Antonio here. Yeah, for you. This is marathon number four for him. And, and for you? And for me? Yes, and for you. What, number what? nine for this year. No, no, no. Yeah. For this year? For him, see? It's possible. Yeah. It's uh, well, January, February. Yeah. Uh, this is number four. See, I'm running hey, 52 man. marathons in 52 weeks. Huh? All around the world. Oh, yeah, see, run like crazy. Hey. <laughs> What's the most incredible thing you've seen this year? Being out in, uh, in Mongolia was, uh, the race that I did there is a 100k race in uh, Lake Hobsgol. It was the most remote place that I've ever been in my life. I mean, it was so departed from anything that we ever see. And uh, it's a national park. It's even a long way from Ulaanbaatar, which is their capital city. But if you go out to Lake Hobsgol, it's, it, they call it the most beautiful run in the world. And, uh, and it's got to be up there with the two oceans as the most beautiful runs that I've ever seen. But being in that space that you know people have been traipsing about on their, on their ponies and that sort of stuff for, for thousands of years, I mean, that's where horses came from. For me to get to, to run through that space and, and not see anyone for many, many kilometres in some sections and then run up next to this lake and have this extraordinary view right next to this little shaman temple with a few yaks grazing just nearby you know I was just like wow you know like this is what I came for you know this is this is what I wanted to see something completely different that I'll never see back home and if I never come back that's fine but uh, but at least I did it that once. What's the most disturbing thing you've seen this year? I've seen a couple of things that really sort of freaked me out a little bit early in the year I, I ran through Mumbai and there's all these kids and people kind of in the river, in the river, picking stuff up out of the water, looking at it to see if it's a usable item that's just floated down the river, and then throwing it back, or picking up some food and looking at that, can I eat that, and then you know, either taking it with them or throwing it back. So to look at that kind of poverty from the people that are in this township, I was running along and I just kind of looked left and I looked right and I looked left and then it all just kind of registered and I just came to a halt. And I was just walking, looking around going, oh, I really am taking this. You know, like I, I would love to say that, that you know, what I'm doing is a fantastic and inspiring thing for so many people around the world. And I'm raising money for UNICEF and a group who are facing Africa and I feel good about that. But look at the opportunity I have just to run a marathon and see the world and do whatever I like. And these people are fishing stuff out of a river just to get by. Going to Rwanda and seeing the genocide museums and all that kind of stuff, that was pretty tough. Seeing kids in the street with big machete wounds into their heads and that sort of stuff, yeah, that, that, that freaked me out a fair bit. But that's why I went there. I went there to get exposed to these things, to see where the money for UNICEF goes, to, um, to understand a bit more about what happens in the world rather than just watch it on TV and read about it in the newspaper. I didn't want to just run 
just to run in fantastically wealthy places around the world. I wanted to see how the other half would as well. Why raise money for charity? You know, probably if I was a better person, I would have taken the 120 grand that I gathered to spend on this trip and just give it all to UNICEF. I often wonder if, you know, that was kind of a poor choice by me just to spend all this money on this amazing adventure for myself. Say hi to the camera. I did sort of consider, you know, how else I can raise money and, and um, I, I do have a lot of people following me on this trip this year and I asked them just if they will to donate $10 or the cost of a movie ticket. They've been reading my blog over a number of months and watching the videos. Then that's not a big ask for them to, do, to donate that money directly to the UNICEF account that I've got set up and to Facing Africa, another group that I like to help. Um, I feel like, like I should be doing more. I hope that in the future I can. How's this changed you, this experience? I like to think I've evolved. I like to think that I've become a better person, or at least a more patient person with life. Um, there's a lot more things that I want to do with my life, and I think that uh, I, I certainly won't be as afraid to uh, take on a challenge of uh, doing something that I would have otherwise thought impossible. But also, I've come to really respect the rest of humanity. I must say that, um, before this year, I've often wondered if people are either fundamentally good or fundamentally bad or stupid people. I say that because there's so much greed and so much horror and so many wars and so many other things that go wrong in the world. But most of what I've seen, places like Israel and India and Rwanda, most of the people living there, they just want to get by, you know. The governments might have other ideas for them, but they just want to get by as people and live a happy life. He's killing it. Yeah. Can't be more than seven years old and he's beaten me. Yeah. Just amazing. I've got so much out of seeing these people give to me. They gift so much of their time and their patience to me, a foreigner who's just showing up in their country on a wild adventure. So I've, I've just got a lot of respect for humanity now. It's been a fantastic experience for me to have. What's the most generous thing anyone's done for you in the last 12 months? Wow, that's hard because I've got so many stories of people going out of their way to, to help me. I've had quite a number of people fly over from Australia to, to race with me in uh, Tokyo, in Berlin, in Sweden, New York. I'm blown away by the fact that people want to change their holidays, change their life and uh, take the two weeks or whatever they've got and come and spend it with me somewhere around the world. So people have literally been changing their travel plans, like and I'm talking, you know, a couple of dozen people have been changing their travel plans just to hang out with me. I think that's extraordinarily generous because I'm not sure that I would have got through this year without those moments with friends and family where they've gone out of their way to fit their lives in around me. But then I've seen things like, you know, like I've, I've had people that don't know me from a bar of soap take me into their home feed me and look after me. One guy even, you know, this guy Gerhard in Austria, he didn't know me at all and he had, he had a, you know, six month old child and he just got back from Hong Kong and his wife's there and he's like, no, come into my home. I'll make this space all right for you because I'm a runner and I know how difficult this can be. And then he drove me the 80 Ks and put me at the, the start line of the race and then looked after me when I got back from the race. It was just so unnecessarily generous and yet so fantastic. Ahead on Aussies abroad, Tristan Miller, rather than cruising to the finish, Tristan embarks upon his toughest challenge of the entire year, a marathon across the ice fields of Antarctica. I've just got to take this one step at a time, put my gear back on, make bigger air holes in my uh, face mask because I just couldn't get enough oxygen in and was getting out of breath. Who's the most amazing person you've met? Haile Gabrielsi. You know, you answered that straight away. He's a great man. You know, he's truly the most extraordinary person on earth. He um, he can run faster than anyone else can across that kind of distance, and yet he's so humble and so lovely. 
and I was in a press conference with him in Dubai. He heard about what I was doing. Someone brought it up and said, you know, this guy in the crowd here, he's running 52 marathons in 52 weeks around the world. And he's just shaking his head going, oh, yeah, very magic. Yeah. that's magic to fly and run and run and fly. It's impossible, but it's magic if you can do it. Good luck, you know, and he shook my hand and he gave me a smile and I tried to hug him. I got a bit weird about it, but it was just so magic. We've spoken about how this experience has changed you and how your perspective on life's changed. What have you learnt about yourself in the last 12 months? It's going to sound a little cliche, I guess, you know, a little lame or, almost, but, you know, I, I think I can do anything. I, I've, I've tried to break myself any number of times this year and uh, coming up with new insane things like, you know, why don't I just go and go to a music festival and halfway through it, take my mate across to the other side of Sweden, run a marathon, drag him back to the music festival, dance away, fly back the next day down to Pamplona to the running of the bulls, run with the bulls, try not to get gored or killed, get in a car, drive to, across France to Switzerland, run up Mount Zermatt, which is really, really steep by the way, and get to the end in like five hours and five and a half hours, get in the car, that same night, drive down to a place near Reggio Emilia in Italy called Bassana, get out of the car in the morning, run another race. Over mountains again in the Tuscan Hills. And get through it and looking at that, I, it should have been impossible. It should have broken me. In, in fact, just drinking and running and partying and running and try not to get gored by bulls, what am I thinking, you know? I mean, think about the long-term goal. What about the long-term goal? getting through 52 marathons in 52 weeks, which is hard enough as it is. But I just wanted to live this whole year as, as fully and as, you know, as, uh, as much as I could. And, and I think I haven't failed myself in that respect, that's for sure. So I've done as many, many things, as many crazy things as I could possibly do in one year. And I think I've just developed a fantastic love for life that I'd like to perpetuate. We've been on this journey with him since he was training for them last year. And we'd penciled in Berlin at the start of the 52, and we never knew how far he'd go. Um, but to actually get to Berlin and know he was still running strong, and know that that was about the time when he needed a little bit of support from home, and he knew we, us guys were coming a long way out. Three days before the marathon, his brother and his sister had come out from uh, from England and Australia to be there with him. And, uh, and, and he went out for that night, we went out to dinner with him, and we thought we'd get a bit of an early night, ran the marathon on Sunday. He and I had a really big night with his brother and sister. Got in the following day, 5 a.m. or something like that, and then we just gone, Tristan, you've blown it, you've blown it. I mean, you know, here you get a chance to run a flat course, great course, run a really good run. And he said, oh, you know, I just want to enjoy myself while I'm here. My brother and sister don't see me that regularly, so I'll just make the most of it, which he did. Two days later, at Berlin uh, Marathon, and runs a PB. 303, and so he ran his, ran his best race for the year on the back of just having a massive night. Most of the conversation has been about the running, but there's actually been a lot of travel that has been um, involved and he is amazing in terms of learning the history of countries and things like that. So he just, he has this way of just learning about every single country and city that he's been in. So he's an absolute wealth of knowledge now. What he has learned along the way, the friendships he's formed, uh, what he's learned about each country, the history, the richness of, of the people. He's just developed so much knowledge about the world and he's you know, obviously come back with so much confidence about what he can achieve um, in life generally. Despite being on the home stretch with just two marathons to go, Tristan decides to take the risk of heading to Antarctica in the hope of running a 100 kilometre ultra marathon across the ice fields. It's a risky proposition, both from a physical and a logistical perspective. There's nothing I could have anticipated and certainly nothing I've trained for this year. Uh, I, I actually went for a 5k run the day before I ran the marathon just to sort of, you know, check my gear and make sure everything was in order. And after 5k's I was looking around like out of breath and, uh, and my legs were in all sorts just from running on this, this snow and just thinking, oh, how am I going to run another 37 k's? And then how am I going to run the 95, another 95 kilometres to do the 100k race that I actually initially went there for? I've just got to take this one step at a time, put my gear back on, make bigger air holes in my uh, face mask because I just couldn't get enough oxygen in. Uh, the air pressure at the, at the poles is actually apparently quite high. 
and, uh, and therefore I was just sucking down and couldn't get enough oxygen into my system and was getting out of breath. This is a tough, tough course. Antarctica, baby! You'd find yourself though running on a patch of ice and so you'd get a bit of rhythm and then you'd hit snow and then you'd hit ice and snow. So it doesn't matter where you're running, you can't find a direct line to run. It's really, really awkward and, you, and my body's not used to doing anything like that. So my hip flexors were getting strained, my legs were getting tired. I, I was like trying to just bat away at the snow and trying to fight it for a while and then you give into it and you're just kind of paddling away hoping to get to the end, you know. What sort of time did you run? Just under five hours. Yeah, I was actually getting close to coming to third place by, by about the sort of 37k mark and then I just, oh, I was tired, I ran out of steam, I ended up coming sixth. I ran like crazy baby and then I'm coming home, I'm gonna come home, I can't wait to come home. The last 5k's I was walking and running and walking and running and just trying to get to the end. But the run itself is just part of the Antarctic challenge. The region's brutal weather making getting out of Antarctica a tricky proposition. A protracted delay could ruin Tristan's hopes of getting his 52nd and final marathon completed inside the 52 weeks. Getting to Antarctica and back again was a bit of a concern for us and because uh, it took a couple of goes before he left I think Chile to get to Antarctica so we're sort of thinking okay what if that's the case coming back so imagine doing all this work and then getting fired up for Marathon 52 and he actually doesn't make it so in the back of my mind I was kind of a little concerned <laughs> that he wouldn't make it back. But, as has been the case all year long, Tristan's luck is in and he manages to sneak out of Antarctica before the weather closes in. After the break, his 52nd and final marathon. Back on home soil with a few hundred of his closest friends. Yeah, it's pretty exciting, you know? Like, I'm trying to get myself to stay calm enough to get through a race first, you know? But then, uh, yeah, as the day wears on, I think I'm going to get more and more emotional. <laughs>
mate, congratulations. Thanks, Chase. How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit tired, a little bit emotional. My legs are absolutely firing. Sometimes I get to the end of these races and my legs are pretty good. Yeah. But uh, right now, I'm, I don't feel that like I could run a whole nother, whole nother couple of laps. Did this one feel any different to the other 51? Uh, just more emotional, mate. I've never talked so much in a race. I was running next to people and just chattering away, chattering away. So each of those laps was just going really, really quickly. So yeah, I mean, it went fast. But then, you know, it's still 42k. I still felt it through my body. I have been talking to my legs quite a bit over the last few weeks. Have they been listening? <laughs> well, they've just been hanging on for dear life. So, you know, there was a bit of chat and I did talk to them a few times and go, if you'll just pull through another few more weeks, then I'll let you do whatever you want. I'm tired from all the travel and I'm tired. I knew that when I came home that I'd have to stay switched on for a few days just to get through this last race and to uh, and yeah, get through Christmas and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but from tomorrow, from tomorrow, I think my brain's just going to capitulate and just uh, take it easy for a while. But uh, I can't wait to catch up on a little bit of sleep and, and not have, you know, I've put a fair bit of pressure on myself to keep completing this and I wouldn't mind just giving myself a little, sort of, my brain a little rest, my body a little rest. Next week, you go back to a normal life, whatever that might be. Yeah, I'm, I'm still grappling with that a little bit, Jase. I, I don't actually know, I don't know what's next, mate. I'd like to write a book. I want to keep running. I want to keep having great adventures because I know how addictive it is and how fantastic it is. I found it, mate. I've met amazing runners around the world who invited me to come and stay in their country and run their massive marathon. I want to keep growing beyond this. How have you grown? It's strange, you know, like I guess I started this, this uh, adventure wanting to, wanting to become more of the man that I always hoped I'd be. And I think the man that I've always hoped to be has grown beyond my understanding now, you know? I've realised that there's so many more adventures and more things beyond my comprehension at the start of the year that, that are possible out there. It's absolutely amazing. I just feel like people should be more adventurous, take a bigger chunk out of life, do more with their lives than the, than the kind of the, the box that we tend to put ourselves into. I've just started to do that. So when you say you, the man that you always hoped you would be, that's what you're talking about. Someone who's getting out and living life, as yeah. opposed to watching other people do it. Yeah. I mean, we spend most of our lives watching other people exceed their own expectations. We spend a lot of our life hoping that someday we could, you know, we could be the sportsman that we always wanted to be, that we could be the father we always wanted to be, that we could be all these things. But we tend to watch other people do it and take our cues from other people. Well, I think that I'm sort of creating a few more cues for myself now, you know. I, I have actually tried to be that person. I find it really difficult to explain because I'm still grappling with myself. I certainly think I'm just scratching the surface and that there's, there's so much more that I can do with my life. I can't go back to the life I had. I'm not sure I can ever get a job like I did before and, and, and be as satisfied by it as I was in the past. Um, I think I'll be doing more adventures, that's for sure. I'm not sure that I'll span an entire year, but I think I'll be doing more adventures and they'll certainly be of a physical nature. I'd love to share Run Like Crazy with other people, you know. I mean, for me, it's an idea, you know, a bit of an ethos now, I guess. I want to lift the bar and do more crazy things, and I hope other people will want to get involved and do those crazy things with me. I'd love to sponsor other people to go on adventures and help them achieve some dreams that they can come up with, as long as it's got a bit of a crazy angle to it. I hope that becomes the norm for my life because I'd like to keep evolving and getting excited about the things and opportunities that the world has to offer. I can't just go back to an office job because I'm not sure that I'd ever fit into one again. Why not? You know, when I was working uh, behind a desk, I would often be really excited about friends of mine that were travelling around the world that sent me emails about the cool things that they'd been up to. I was really uh, addicted to hearing their exciting tales of their, their travels because it got me through my days. And in fact, one of my mates, you know, I sent him some money just to make sure he kept going because I know he knew he was really struggling. And I could hear about them and live vicariously. I don't see why I shouldn't be the guy that's doing all the adventures and other people can keep living vicariously. I don't think I want to be the guy sitting behind the desk anymore just hearing about it. If I really want to be greater in life or enjoy life a lot more, what's stopping me? There's nothing stopping me, so I should just at least figure out a new plan and then head in that direction and see what comes next.
I really hope I can continue to appreciate what the world has to offer and go out and give something back as well. What's the message that we can all learn out of him doing this? You've got a goal, you've got a dream, go for it and, and don't get stopped by no. Get up and live as if you're going to die the next day. Love you with the boys. Tokyo. Think big, be bold, and just get out there and do it. Yeah. Top of the world, mate. Don't ever give up. Just go for it. All for you. If you're determined and you've got drive, anything really is possible.